rocket launcher can fire 10 rounds per second. It belongs firmly on the modern battlefield. But researchers have discovered a mysterious reference to a missile launcher from the ancient world with a rate of fire that's almost as high. And it's nearly 2,000 years old. Lost and forgotten within ancient Chinese texts is an obscure reference to a multiple launch catapult with a rate of fire of more than eight rounds per second. Could the ancient Chinese have invented a weapon that challenges the modern rocket launcher? In 200 AD, China was a nation at war with itself. Governors went to great lengths to protect their subjects from attack. The Chinese had always been very good at building fortified cities, which is one reason why they had to devote such enormous resources to the problem of destroying or defeating these defences. Siege warfare in the ancient world involved wearing down the enemy. This trebuchet takes a full 20 minutes to reload. How could the ancients speed up the reloading process to increase the rate of fire? A text written in 232 AD by the inventor Ma Zhong describes a prototype for a catapult that had the highest rate of fire of any in the ancient world. According to the historical accounts, you have a very large wooden flywheel and once you've set it in motion the centrifugal force throws out the missiles on the end of a piece of rope as each missile reaches the top of the wheel a knife blade cuts through the rope leaving the missile free to fly forward but could the prototype have actually worked with no knowledge of how or where the weapon was used if at all Ancient technology specialist Richard Windley is building what he hopes will be a working scale model. This is another of these pieces, really, which we've only got vaguest of textual references to. Ma Zhong does not specify what missiles were to be used in the machine, but as rate of fire was its most important feature, archaeologists assume the missiles would have been relatively cheap to produce and made of simple stone moving at great speeds at a very high rate of fire. The first test is with a single stone. On this model, because of the size, we've got to actually generate quite high speeds. The larger the wheel, the slower it would need to rotate. So if you had a 20 or 30 foot wheel, we'd probably only want maybe one revolution a second. Richard is intending to get the wheel up to three revolutions per second, which will project the balls at 130 kilometers per hour. The first shot is powerful, but the range is short, a mere 15 metres. Two things there. We, we managed to get a fair speed up. Uh, the knife successfully actually cut through the rope, which was one of the things we were slightly concerned about. But it did look as though the point of cutting was too early. It looks as though it's actually hurling it into the ground. So it looks as though we've got to have a rethink on the actual position of the knife blade. Time to get out the toolbox. Richard needs to alter the angle of the blade so that it cuts the ropes earlier, thus releasing the balls into a higher and therefore longer trajectory. With the angle of the blade moved backwards, Richard arms the catapult to its full launch capability. Eight iron missiles of around three kilos each. We got a lot more range that time, and it seems to be kind of throwing it up in the air slightly more. Eight balls traveling at 130 kilometers an hour deliver 16 kilojoules of energy. In terms of the mechanics, it's, it seems like a sound idea. If we scale this thing up to the sort of size that um, Marjun was reputed to have used, you know, we're, we're in with a viable possibility of a weapon, I think. The demonstration has shown that the catapult could have been effective if it had been used. The Chinese were very meticulous about keeping records of these sorts of inventions. And there are numerous military manuals published from the 11th century onwards, which illustrate an enormous variety of catapults. So the fact that this one does not appear in these later manuals strongly suggests that it was never used. The main problem seems to be that the framework and the base was so heavy that it would be impossible once it was set up to alter the aim of it. Each time you chose a different target, the whole device would have to be moved and reset up, which would be a fairly mammoth task. 
Occasionally, researchers come across documentary evidence of ancient weapons as good as any modern blueprint. One such has been recovered from ancient Greece. It describes an innovative machine that plays on man's most primeval fear. Fire is one of the primary weapon systems used even in the 21st century. You set a man on fire and he's out of the firing line. Once that man is burning, he's out of the line and so are his mates because they want to put him out before he, he starts to hurt. The earliest known machine to employ the deadly power of fire dates back over 2,000 years and it was used not only against troops but the fabric of an entire city. In 424 BC, a tribe known as the Boeotians put this power to great effect. They were laying siege to the town of Delium in central Greece to win it back from the Athenians. The defenders had thrown together a lot of wood and roots and all kinds of material to bind up a, an earthen defense. To the Boeotians, all that wood stacked up within the walls suggested an obvious weapon of attack. They come up with a flamethrower, quite a big flamethrower. How could such a weapon system have been possible? And was it enough to defeat the Athenians? Clues were recorded by the ancient writer Thucydides. Thucydides is an Athenian general and statesman who gets sacked about halfway through the Peloponnesian War. And like most generals who get sacked halfway through a war, he wants to prove that they shouldn't have sacked him. So he sits down to do something unusual. He writes a book. And his book is the first serious political examination of the phenomenon of war, not as something to write legends about, but something that happens to real people. It really is a rich and powerful text that we still read to this day. They sawed in two and hollowed out a great beam, which they then joined together again very exactly, like a flute, and suspended a vessel by chains at the end of the beam. The iron mouth of a bellows, directed downwards into the vessel, was attached to the beam, of which a great part was itself overlaid with iron. This machine was brought up from a distance on carts to various points of the rampart, and when it was near the wall, they applied a large bellows to their own end of the beam and blew through it. The blast passed into the vessel which contained burning coals, sulfur and pitch. These made a huge flame and set the rampart ablaze. Because of the detailed description left by Thucydides, Richard is able to build one of the most accurate reconstructions he has ever made. It's a very, very simple device. Large bellows, big long tube, fire pot on the end. The bellows will blow it a bit like a blacksmith's fire. We could raise the temperature probably two or threefold with a good direction of air into the pot. At first, the flamethrower does not appear to be very effective. But as the oxygen from the nozzle passes over the combustibles, things start to heat up. Eventually, Richard can produce a directional heat source capable of delivering fire right into the walls of a city. Once or twice, when we just got the angle correct, I think um, we were getting very, very intense heat. We were getting almost a white heat, which is, which is really quite hot. White flame is only produced by temperatures over 1,000 degrees. If we think that this design was something like 2,500 years old, um, you know, this, was, this is quite impressive technology for the time. Wooden walls would have provided little comfort for the defending troops. According to Thucydides, the Boeotians used this weapon to set fire to Delium and chase away the Athenians. Only 200 or so Athenians were killed. The rest were allowed to escape. Using ultra-modern technology, the Boeotians managed to defeat mighty Athens, a true testament to the power of engineering. But despite this, Athens went on to become one of the most powerful cities in the ancient world and is still the capital of Greece some two and a half thousand years later. From the soaring ambition of the repeating catapult to the ingenious application of a basic resource like fire, military engineering developed over millennia to produce terrifying and powerful technologies. 
But these innovations were just the beginning. The modern aircraft carrier can't do its job without an essential piece of hardware that is 2,000 years old. In a message fragment from ancient Egypt, a deadly long-range weapon is described that relied only on the power of air. For every operation, the modern aircraft carrier relies on a technology that was developed in ancient Egypt over 2,000 years ago. Ancient machines expert Richard Windley is researching an ancient text to discover the origins of this simple but powerful technology. In the ancient world, the catapult was the technological front runner in the arms race. It had the ability to store and release far more energy than a single man could possibly unleash. The stored energy is known as potential energy. Nearly all throwing devices use the same operating principle. They convert potential energy into kinetic energy. And the potential energy is either stored in some form of elastic, be it twisted rope or elastic bands in the form of a handheld catapult. A trebuchet stores the energy in gravity by having the weights held up high. And all that happens is that you then release the potential energy and convert that into the kinetic energy that's in the missile. The standard catapult in the ancient world was the torsion catapult. Torsion catapult works by twisting up fibres which can retain energy while cocking the mechanism so that the arms of the catapult are actually linked up to the torsion and the trigger then releases all of that energy by unwinding whatever you've wound up. The materials used were animal sinew, hemp and stretched leather. Using only organic fibers, a common torsion-heavy catapult in the Roman army could unleash two and a half megajoules of potential energy, enough power to shoot a 130 kilo missile for over half a kilometer. But in 280 BC, in the Egyptian city of Alexandria, a new world-changing technology science was in its infancy. Once you go to using iron, it's a non-perishable material. You get a more reliable performance. You're not dealing with perishable sinews, hemp fibers. These are things that are going to deteriorate quite quickly in use. The ability to work metal to precision allowed the creation of airtight seals in pneumatic systems. We all now take in the modern world pneumatics for granted. All the buses and trucks that people travel in, um, they all have pneumatic brakes. Message fragments from ancient Egypt hint at the ambition to harness this power for war. The idea that somebody then harnessed pneumatics to make a, a missile firing device really stand out as a, as a bit of sort of advanced thinking at the time. Scientists today can use these ancient references to construct a model of the machine 2,000 years later. The design shows one of the first pistons in history. 